Welcome to the One Special Place podcast. We have with us Dr. Kedar Dilwe, who's a leading psychiatrist and counselor in Mumbai. Welcome to our show, sir. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, doctor, from your experience, what are the various speech and language uh, difficulties that you observe in psychiatric patients? We have stuttering, stammering, and usually associated with a lot of anxiety. Sometimes even uh, leads to depressive features in a patient, where uh, language the patients can help immediately. Of course, uh, the primary source of um, interventions from a speech and language therapist is usually going to come in childhood, especially with uh, childhood-related disorders. The most prominent, obviously, being autism, right. autism spectrum, and it is one of the integral hallmark treatments that you can actually send your child to because the earlier the intervention, the more better the prognosis. Right. Um, and better manage the condition. So autism is one, anxiety is another. Um, when it comes to speech and language therapy, uh, a lot of the times neurological conditions uh, like infarcts and strokes or any insult to the brain. <clears throat> any insult to the brain is going to cause a situation where you require an intervention. You require the person to be able to formulate actual language okay. from the avenue of a insult to the brain, which has its own challenges because it depends on the sort of office that it depends on the sort of manifestation that the patient has, which will vary from patient to patient. So, any person with a neurological uh, illness will benefit from speech and uh, language uh, therapy right. interventions. Right. In fact, we do have a lot of our clients mm -hmm. who are post-stroke, they are undergoing speech therapy because there is a lot of slurring, there is a, uh, again, aphasia is one more kind of patients yes. that we do have and we see a lot of uh, our therapists working with them and it's made a huge difference, in fact. So you need to understand the psychological connotations that this can. When you teach a person the art of language, you are going to teach a person how to communicate. That person is not going to be isolated. They are going to look forward to treatment. The prognosis improves. The resilience improves. The quality of life multiplies tenfold, twentyfold. Purely because of the fact that a person who could not communicate now can actually learn how to articulate words and move forward. Any form of communication once learned will improve the prognosis drastically. Right. Especially in patients who have had strokes or infarcts, because it's a very scary situation to find yourself in. And if you're not able to communicate, it amplifies. So it also reduces the burden of the disease. And like I said, Amplifies the quality of life. Right. 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 Excellent. Uh, so we see an increasing number of uh, children who are addicted to screens, mm. especially, and there's a whole uh, talk about uh, virtual autism. Mm. What is your take on this? Because especially children who are born in the COVID era, mm. uh, we're able to see that they're not very social mm. with their peers, they've been living in mm. nuclear families, etc. So what is your take on this? Well, that's a very interesting observation because the group that you're talking about is usually those children who were born after 2020 or who were one or two year old at that time. Children who had already started speaking, started interacting, did not have that much of a crisis. But in this particular group, that is those who were one or two years and born after the event, it impacted them immensely. To the extent that after begin again and once the school started, it actually led to an oversimplification of the diagnosis. Forgetting he already right, this can actually benefit purely from interactions. I think the reason for this was that we were in a situation where social interaction was not present. Okay. And kids have a mirroring effect. So they will learn from observation. And when they are not playing with kids of their age, it's going to cause a concern. So that was one issue 
to which led to was speech delays and language delays. The second part of it was we had screens becoming the part of life. It was no longer four hours. It was twenty hours on screens and four hours if you could sleep. So kids actually never end up speaking during that time. And any screen will tend to overstimulate your dopamine receptors, cause you to become addicted to it, cause you to become dependent on it. I mean, how many times have we had the habit of actually checking our phones the first time we get up? Okay. So, expecting it of kids was perhaps asking too much of them immediately. But the social changes, the the actual lifestyle changes, and the fact that they could not interact with kids of their age has led to a significant delay in speech and language when it comes to children of that particular age group. They should be around. It will be for four, five years. The amazing thing is now that they are actually interacting, a lot of them are getting back their speech, which is a fantastic thing. But of course, in certain cases where it would have been mild to moderate, because of the scenario, it became severe. Right, and that was a confounding factor, and that's a scary level which we need to be aware of. Right. So, in this kind of a situation, what, according to you, is the role that an SLP can especially intervene? So, an SLP usually starts off by creating one-on-one situations where they can interact with the person, tailor make a treatment for them, find out what motivates them, find out how they respond. If you look at it. It's basically a form of counseling in which you have to encourage the right person in the right way, figure out their difficulties and move forward. Um, have you seen the teen speech? Yes, I have. So it depends a lot on the therapist. It depends a lot on the client, and you have to tailor make it to the client. So. Just the small things of how to get them to sit down, how to get them to do that, um, working with them on small lists, on small um, struggles, encouraging them, figuring out ways of actually encouraging their conversations will benefit the client immensely. So I don't think it's a rigid protocol, right? But there is a little bit of art in what they do, and it helps. Uh, Also, to consciously try and touch upon an area which needs to be worked on, It will enable the person to move forward with the, the right sort of treatment and the right sort of goals that they want to achieve. So, a healthy practitioner, when it comes to let's say autism, is integral because without that step, there can be no build there. Okay. Without a person, a person who has a list needs to get that out of the way. Otherwise, this is going to be a social um, detriment to him okay. for his career also. So, small things, but they go a long way. Basically, because speech is nothing more than articulation of your thoughts. Okay. So, it comes down to what you want to sit down and discuss. But from the biggest of aphasias to the smallest of risks, sitting down and talking with that person will always help and enable you. Uh, so the next question I would like to ask you, doctor, is what is the role of OTs when it comes to behavioral challenges, especially when it comes to psychiatric patients? Occupational so, therapy is uh, mandatory for kids with autism. Then benefit. Um, Is mandatory when you are trying to teach simple tasks to uh, children or people who are challenged. It's a great way of integrating things, great way of uh, getting them to respond to situations. Motor coordination obviously has to improve, otherwise speech and the actual daily activities will be difficult. Um, when it comes to autism, it's an integral part of the treatment. Sensory training is absolutely necessary. 
it is also one of the ways that we can actually put across information and start eliciting a response from a child. So that goes a long way in treatment of autism. Right. The other areas where this could work is uh, situations where you are going to have a person recovering from severe motor issues right. or severe um, social impairments. So even the task of going to the OB session, interacting with the therapist and getting a response is going to go a long way in helping a person overcome the social hurdles, right. the social niceties that need to be followed. Um, depending on the scenario, you can have OT intervene at other areas in psychiatry. Um, but that completely depends on what sort of a person you're living with and what are the impairments that he or she is suffering from. So, yeah. autism and uh, let's say a person who is having a stroke, trying to recover. For them, the normal conversations may be difficult. So if you can get the person to sit down, uh, do small exercises, improves their interactability, improves the chances of response. So these three areas to definitely. Motor coordination disorder. Not like most very but people who require fine skills will respond wonderfully to OT treatments. Right, right, sure. Those are some places. Great, thank you, Dr. So, Doctor, um, the next question which I want to come is how important are day to day interventions, any specific interventions when it comes to autistic children? The whole idea of uh, managing autism is figuring out a daily routine for a child. You will be surprised by how a small activity will go a long way in reducing the burden on the parents and reducing the meltdown of the child. Um, it starts with self-care starts with how do you get the child to understand um, that a bath is necessary, that grooming is necessary, how do you get a child to allow you to do that, okay. how do you get a person with autism to understand that they have to dress up, respond. That can be one specific training. The other specific training involves necessarily around food, how do you get a, a child, how do you get the person to eat properly. Um, are there any techniques? And what happens is because autism is such a isolating illness that the family usually ends up figuring their own way out of it. And the problem with that is when you try to do this by yourself, you might have a genius idea for one situation. But the other 20 situations will cause problems and since you can't figure it out, will lead to cumbersome burdens. Right. So, any sort of training which is specific, how to structure a deal, how to greet a child, how to feed a child, how to dress a child, what are the nap time rituals that you can follow, you know, what are the protocols that you can use to de-escalate a child's meltdown. Okay. Anything will be extremely beneficial. And if you can get the child to eat properly, if you can get the child to take the medicines on time, uh, if you can get a child to just stay healthy, a lot of the ancillary concerns for this also need to help. Right, right. So when you are telling me about the program, that you guys have Correct. Right. So we in fact have a taste program mm -hmm. which we have specifically launched mm -hmm. for helping parents to help their child build a healthy relationship with food. Yeah. So, in fact, I'm also thinking like, uh, for example, visual scheduling mm -hmm. would be something which would be very important mm -hmm. for autistic children mm -hmm. and for getting them that rigidity mm -hmm. to their day, mm -hmm. isn't mm -hmm. it, doctor? Um, yeah, the framework to the day is absolutely necessary and any sort of uh, technique that you can use will ensure that the child responds better, will lead to lesser write-downs, lesser interventions. 
better quality of food. And that's what managing the illness is about in this case. Right. So yeah, so not only this, there are so many other programs where you can actually benefit. Um, rituals that you can learn, uh, methods that can be used to calm a child down. Sensory integration plays a role, obviously. There are other ones too. So yes, any structured activity. And once you start thinking about it, pace will just be one of the things you will come up with many more interventions. If you can streamline it, it makes having a person with autism in the family just a part of the delivery, not a challenge that needs to be navigated every day. You figure out the way and you structure your life, you live your life and you allow the child or the person to improve in the quality of their life simultaneously. Right, right. Brilliant doctor. Uh, doctor, before we close, mm -hmm. I would definitely like to talk to you about and ask your opinion mm -hmm. about there is a global shortage mm. of ADHD medicines mm. and uh, especially countries like US and mm. UK are mm. facing this mm. and people are finding it very difficult to navigate mm. through this. What is your opinion about this and uh, what can be done? What is the reason that this has come, that this has come out to be? The ADHD medicines are very very um, strict medicines. Can't be prescribed to the dog of my Requires specific criteria to be met. Requires specific severity to be met. But you're talking of this and UK. I'll give you an example of what happened in India during COVID times. Because in the first three months, the blanket uh, was you could not prescribe. And the medicines could not reach the children or the adults who were yeah. And that led to a lot of issues. You have to understand that radiation medicine would work on that day. Okay. So the absence of it is going to impair the quality of life of that person. Only happens, the treatment is given only in moderate to severe cases. If the moderate or severe ADHD precipitates, it's a task for the patient and the relatives together. So why is this no substitution? Small uh, roles small um, interventions, how to improve concentration skills, sessions devoted to improving motor skills, uh, learning de-escalation methods, uh, learning focusing techniques, right. um, therapy, to the best of your ability, um, swimming, um, any sort of activity which allows you to focus better will go a long way. Because non pharmacological interventions are absolutely essential in a person's career. Manage those and the need for the medicine will use. The global shortage of medicines might happen, so it's happening. And if it is there, then we are going to have a uh, significant intervention problem. But looking up ancillary treatments could help. Right. Of course, that said, I have to be very clear. When medicines are required, medicines are required. So your uh, local practitioner will know how to use it. We'll try and do alternative medicines. So it's not an excuse. But if absolutely no level, then other interventions will also help. Right. So thank you so much, Doctor, for taking out your time and spending this hour with us. It's been really a very interesting conversation. We have spoken about so many topics. Uh, I know it's been a busy day for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, family. Great. So do check out the other episodes of ours at One Special Place Podcast. We'll be back with another episode next week. Thank you.